a discussion. Maureen, unfortunately, isn't able to stay with us, so I will pretend to be Maureen <laughs> because I'm also a psychologist. So my name's Louise Dye. I'm a psychologist from the University of Leeds, and I actually work on the impact of nutrition on cognition. However, I work on slightly older subjects, so older children from the age of six, and I'm also interested in the, the bit of the curve that Maureen said we were all more or less sitting in, so how to preserve cognitive function in older age. And I think what I took away from this morning a little bit was, in some ways, the boat's already left, and our parents are responsible for our older older life trajectories. But we must think positively and think about what we can actually do to intervene, both in terms of our older health, but also in terms of what we do for the next generations. And I think if we put that in the context of the Institute Merieux, one of the most worrying aspects that came across this morning, which I'm very familiar with, is the loss of human capital that a poor diet in early childhood can actually instigate. So the question there is, what can we do? If we take into account that um, the leader of the World Bank had said something like 26% lower adult income, it's very clear from the African National Bank's own analysis too that the loss of human capital or the failure in sub-Saharan Africa of children to reach their full adult potential has massive issues in the long term for capacity building in those countries. And I think the science that we're talking about over the last couple of days really needs to be addressed at how we build some of that, how we redress some of those problems. So um, I have two speakers with me today. Michel Neunlist, you're familiar with. He just gave us a very interesting insight into the impact of the enteric nervous, nervous system um, on subsequent behavior. And I'd like to introduce Angèle Glubo, if I say that correct, yes. um, who is here from Pilage. Pilage. Um, Michel Ang Angèle is um, a geneticist by background, but she's working now developing dietary supplements and health solutions in Pilage, in particular in terms of microbiota phytotherapy and nutrition, but she also provides education for healthcare professionals. So I hope she's going to help me to put some of this material from this morning in context and to make some suggestions for solutions. So I think I will start by asking Michel a question about the animal work that he's produced, that he's shown us in, in great detail this morning. And really it's about how we t what we take away from that and um, how we can translate that into um, evidence of relevance for the human population. Michel. Um, I think this is a very, indeed, very important question is all the data that has been produced in mice is how, of course, this, whether it applies uh, to, to, to human. And for now, I think uh, that there is a need to, I think, to advance on, on, on two sides is, of course, to, to to explore further in animal models, especially, and taking into account that the brain mice is very different also from the human mice. Is on the side of the animal model experiments, it has to be developed and used the animal models that are probably more relevant to the human brain. And in particular, I think there is a, uh, some efforts that are developed in larger animal models, such as the pigs, uh, where the research and new cognition can, can be gained, and especially because we can translate also from the human to the pig, at least at the level of the tools, because the cartography of the pig has been improved by modern uh, uh, um, functional imaging techniques. Uh, the atlas is being built up. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, and uh, I think that the pig is still a good model uh, for, 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 the, for the human, especially for the brain, and maybe for, for the gut also in terms probably of, of diet. Of course, it takes uh, much more space than Housing pigs that takes much more space than housing mice, but uh, the price of a pig is not much more expensive than the price of a, a, a mice. So I think this is clearly a, an effort that has to be put uh, forward and advanced. And then, of course, I think uh, trying to perform uh, translational studies in selecting specific 
cohort of patients because one of the confounding factors that is already present in mice, that is the large diversity of response depending on the genetic diversity of the mice, which is a very genetically uh, uh, fixed uh, strains. You can imagine that in a human population, the genetic variant is much wider. And then in diseased uh, population where you have impact of other factors, it's even mm -hmm. larger. So I think... Uh, a major goal is to perform clinical study, but in very stratified uh, population of patients yeah. and uh, with uh, very specific Thank outcomes. I think, I think one of the things mm. that Michelle showed us this morning was the impact of protein restriction. And if I may draw mm. a parallel between the, the data that Maureen presented, where she talked about food insecurity, and she talked about the quality of the diet in food insecure families. And the major impact there was that protein and fruits and vegetables were reduced. So I already saw, from a nutritional point of view, a great parallel between what you showed us about the impact of maternal protein restriction on learning and development in the mouse and the impact that we see in terms of the cognitive development of children growing up in a food insecure environment where the quality of the diet is definitely impacted upon by protein restriction. I think the other parallel that I saw was um, when you try to think about, well, fruits and vegetables. What are we getting from fruits and vegetables? And if that food is um, not available in the diet, um, I think we're seeing some evidence now that polyphenols, which are very rich, um, fruits and vegetables are very rich sources of polyphenols, um, have an impact on gut microbiota. There is some evidence, and I think Angel will tell me a bit more about that. Uh, but also they have an impact on acetylcholine and brain-derived neurotrophic factor, which is very important for cognitive function in the hippocampus. So perhaps that leads me to involve Angèle in the conversation about um, if we cannot provide those fruits and vegetables, can we do supplementation? Are there nutrients that you are uh, aware of that we can start to develop? Okay. Um, First, at Pillage, we have two domains of expertise, so microbiota and uh, also plant extracts for herbal medicine. And recently, we uh, were interested in uh, the content of polyphenol in this, uh, in this extract. And uh, we showed that um, polyphenol-rich extract from uh, cinnamon or, or grape pomace are able to um, have effect in context of diabetes or steatosis by um, the interaction with microbiota. So sure, uh, it's, um, it's a very important point. And uh, when you are not able to eat, uh, to have a diversified and well-balanced uh, diet, uh, dietary supplement allows to control your dietary intake and to be sure that, to, uh, that you receive enough, for example, polyphenol. Okay, so supplementation in the absence of other foods might be a strategy. Yes, yeah, so or when, you, <coughs> when you, you can't eat some fresh food, because it's important that uh, vegetables are fresh, uh, to have their full contents of nutrients. So dietary supplements can be helpful in these cases. Okay. okay. Can I throw it open now because I'm aware we've got a very short discussion this morning and ask for some questions from the audience or some comments? John? Uh, thanks, Louise. I, I had a, a question again for Dr. Neunlist, but it's a general question potentially I, I could throw out to everybody concerning models. And, and specifically this morning, looking at the germ free rodent as a model, I, I, I'd like really to have your, your thoughts on it in terms of its validity. You know, the germ-free rodent has a grossly enlarged cecum. The diaphragm is pressed up and flattened. So effectively, they're sick animals. They're sick because of the, the, the gross physiological change in the, in the gut, in the abdomen. Now, if I had a gut pain, I wouldn't feel terribly sociable as a human. So to what extent here is your conclusion that it's microbiota-related, the social, the social uh, uh, um, uh, changes as are, micro, are microbiota related, or are they consequent upon this change in gut physiology that takes place as a consequence 
of the microbiota. You know, are, are we moving too far in some of the models? And, and another thought from an industrial point of view, industry, industry does not want to use animals if it, if it can avoid them. This, this is a very important principle that we've got to underline. The three R's, you know, we, we haven't heard much of that. So, you know, are there, are there ways of moving away, either, you know, better translation from the animal to the clinical, or indeed eliminating the animal completely? But those are just my thoughts. Okay. There are two questions, enfin, two, three questions. I, uh, in what you said, the first one, uh, whether the, the mouse model of jam free is a valid animal model, and if you suggest that uh, because they have an enlarged second, it's a disease, but I think this is maybe just uh, adaptation, it's physiological adaptation, it's not disease. So it's just the response of the second to an absence of microbiota. It's not necessarily uh, a disease state. And all what has been shown in the data, uh, in the studies, and this is how science, I think, advances, it's not just using one method to explain the role of microbiota, it's that it's completing with different uh, methods, suggesting, of course, that microbiota ha has a role. And the question arises, what, yeah, what are the microbial compounds, whether it's, we just spoke about microbiota, uh, about bacteria, we don't speak about viruses, about phages, we don't speak about fungi, I think in the microbiome is probably also a key actor, I think we're facing a complexity that needs to, to advance, uh, enfin, where we model to advance to produce uh, data, and uh, of course all models are imperfect, but mm -hmm. your questions uh, of using models versus uh, uh, respecting the, the, the three R's, I think, I personally think that the animal model is still an integrated system, and I think we need integration, we need physiological integrated responses, but I also agree that we need uh, to develop uh, alternatives, and I think one of the alternatives that is being developed uh, recently, and in particular in our lab, we have developed some uh, organoids based from uh, using IPS, fibroblast data from, from patients to get more uh, or uh, lab, on, uh, lab on chip uh, that are being designed to try to reconstruct uh, these organs on chip uh, with the advantage of using also human tissue to to get the genetic, uh, to get the ability to study the interaction between environmental factors and the genetic factor of the host, where we are able to reconstruct some organs and some interaction. I think this is an endeavor that is going on and that can help to partially respond to the to your question. So, Mark, you had a question or a comment? Mm. Yes. Well, mm. I think that it's always an endless discussion: the relevance of uh, preclinical models and uh, how we can. Uh, best exploit actually the information that we can draw from this, uh, out of these clinical models. I think that, uh, first of all, a preclinical model aims at uh, strengthening a working hypothesis, trying to identify some possible mechanism, testable me mechanism, then that must be tested and validated in clinical trials. So I think it's a kind of de-risking strategy, but naturally, I think that, uh, the, the, the preclinical model will all have their limitation, but at least they allow actually to perform some pre-screening of working hypotheses, of compounds, of doses, and so on. But naturally, they are limited. But uh, I think that it, it will be always an intrinsic limitation of all yeah. these models. Yeah. Yeah, but I think also that there is a key issue in terms of using animal models also with the, the with the, the push at the EU Commission of replacing animals. Of, uh, forbidding, uh, for uh, how do you say this? Forbidden uh, research on animal models and to do everything on supporting the three R rules. And I think we have to be critically aware that uh, for now on we still need uh, animal models uh, before uh, having established uh, these new uh, models. And I think we, we have to fight to preserve this uh, exploration animal models. In my opinion. And today we really need to decipher mechanisms, and I think that uh, clinical uh, preclinical pre models are one one step to better understand what are the mechanisms involved in uh, communication, for example, between uh, gut and brain, and uh, it's one element among others, but. Uh, we need to go on with this kind of experimentation. Here again, improvement of this model, well, rely, uh, we, they must be fed 
with uh, information drawn from uh, clinical studies. Yes, so to answer to, to back and forth. Uh, yesterday, somebody told that it's uh, to, it's a question of need. What are the needs, and uh, uh, at which question we want to, we to answer? So, it's important to keep in mind that the final goal is to improve health and to have clinical uh, beneficial clinical effect. And I think we can actually be quite creative in some of the human models that we use. So. <laughs> Um, if I take the example now, the most stressful thing that you can do to an individual is to make them speak in public. <laughs> so, and I think if we were going to measure the cortisol levels of um, the people on the stage, they would be considerably higher than the people in the audience. Yeah. And do you and think, I think that uh, our level of corticosterone is different? Between right now and, uh, it is, yeah. Okay. <laughs> Right now, I really promise you it is. Um, but we can use some human models and some, you know, I'm a psychologist. I like to do deceptive things to people, yeah? Um, so, you know, we can actually try and look at some of those human things. And I bring it back to what we talked about in the discussion, in the presentations, was uh, Michelle talked and Maureen talked about the impact of stress and the activation of stress on the HPA axis. So it's amusing to say, yes, we're all quite stressed, standing here waiting for you to ask us questions. Of course, that's true. But in a long term, and, but that's a very beneficial process to be in at that moment in time. That's the evolutionary adaptive significance of stress. It's so that we can fight you or run away from you. Yeah? Unfortunately, if you have kids in a situation of food insecurity, where they don't know where the next meal is coming from, that's a chronic stressor. And I think what Michel showed in his animal models was the impact of maternal stress. I think Maureen implicated maternal stress on the child development. And I think we should consider very carefully um, how we can use nutrition to attenuate or ameliorate the impact of stress. And I think certainly from my own research, but I know from the work of others, there are nutritional ingredients, supplements, dietary practices. And certainly we can say, well, get rid of the food insecurity in the first place. That's easier said than done, I think, when we take a worldwide perspective. So we have to look at where we can make those beneficial interventions. Um, so thinking about the impact of stress then and the activation of the HPA axis, are there things, Angèle, Michelle, that we could suggest might be beneficial? Beneficial for, uh, for symptoms or to improve uh, health status? Uh, sure, because, uh, for example, uh, um, when I discuss with a health professional, um, in children, they, um, uh, they uh, ask for uh, health solutions for hyperactivity, for example, or for deficit of attention, and uh, there is also a lot of uh, um, requests or demands concerning uh, autistic disorders, but um, we we do some we perform some uh, studies uh, mainly uh, preclinical studies for instance but uh, I hope uh, clinical studies too to um, to modulate microbiota or to reshape in order to reduce symptoms or to compensate for stress experiment experiences in early life so. I think that we can um, suggest or propose some intervention, but um, it's too early to say what. Mm -hmm. And so you mentioned that you felt that autism spectrum disorders were increasing. Um, I wondered if that's actually more that we're getting better at diagnosing them and we're more likely to classify people on the basis of some of those behaviours that would otherwise have gone um, less well reported in the past. We have a lot more media presence, more awareness of autism spectrum disorders. So that was one question, one clarification I thought we should make. 
the other question I had for both of you, I think, because of what Angela's just said, is how confident are we that the gut microbiota is a causal link in autism spectrum disorders, or how much is it correlatively an aspect of their behavior and experience? I'm, I'm not a specialist of, uh, of ASD, uh, but uh, we work a little bit uh, on, on this subject, and um, so that's why what I say is uh, to be taken with caution. Um, uh, concerning the first question, I think I mentioned this already in the, the talk to say that the, one explanation of this exponential rise where it was in the 70s uh, a rare disease, uh, one case in 5,000, and now it's uh, being identified and one to 68 birth is uh, clearly the, the, the new uh, the people are more aware and they are earlier diagnosis, but still. Uh, uh, 20 years ago, the same tools, diagnostic tools were used. So it's not based on the diagnostic tool, but maybe more on the awareness that can explain it. But probably it's not the, the only explanation. It doesn't explain for this exponential increase. There are other environmental factors that have been probably suggested, associated, such as uh, pollutants. Uh, environmental. Or, uh, pardon? Environmental. Uh, environmental factors, yeah, that yeah. are strongly linked and again this is the difficulties in translating correlation clinical studies to as a causal effect and this makes also the transition to the microbiota where uh, that's why I put this study a little bit on purpose where uh, in the purely genetical model we there was also uh, this biosis presence meaning that uh, who is the cause of the consequences still remains uh, Defined, but it's still an actor that contributes yeah. to the development. It's a cofactor of the disease, and I think it's maybe useless to try to say uh, it's the cause or the consequence. What is important is to to identify as a contributor of the disease mm -hmm. and therefore as a target. So I think yeah. this is yes, to identify a signature either in bacterial component, component or or metabolites, but to to better understand and to be able to to propose some uh, intervention to promote to improve that status effect. I think there is a question. Yeah, Patrice. Is your microphone on? <laughs> 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 No, just just want to say that uh, probably 15 years ago or more, th there has been some uh, some publication already on on the potential impact of probiotics on autism. Uh, but at the same time, there has been also other attempts for for treating autism, like uh, uh, omega three or or, or, or phosphatidyl serine or these kind of things. I, I think that would be, we, it would be good to have uh, the same model and testing different ways, different different things. Like, uh, do they work the same way? on these models. Does omega-3 work the same way as probiotics or work the same way as, as uh, phosphatidylserine? You know, because o otherwise we are still stuck to a model, on not only to the model, but the model with the ingredients. So uh, I think we should maybe look at a little bit wider. Okay, any more comments or questions? Just as a reflection, I don't know whether we have to go towards uh, looking what one compound does uh, specifically on a model, because I think we rather should go on integrating, because wh why is the microbiota, I think, so interesting? Because it produces a, a wide range of mediators that can have differential functional impacts on different organs, and, uh, and, and suggesting that uh, it's more advantageous to have a, a multi-pharmacological substance that produces a, a substance that can have a multi-targeted effect than just one substance after the other. You see what, enfin, what I tried yeah, to explain, I, sorry. Uh, I understand what you say, but we, we don't have solutions uh, except no, the course, fe fecal transplantation or these kind of things where we, we are going to transfer completely uh, no. and, uh, gut flora to, uh, to the patients. But we are not able today to say this kind of bacteria or probiotics has a very strong effect on autism because versus because the other one. A, because I think the disease is such a broad, there are so, so many subtypes. There is this need of stratifying the patients and to start, as mentioned, from the patient's symptom to better understand what is the disease because it's a complex disease. And, yes. and this is true maybe for autism, but it's true for a large 
range of chronic disease and to take it into account also in terms of evolution of chronic disease because you will not treat the patient when it's at the beginning of the disease the same way that you should be at the end of the disease. You know? and, uh, I think this is the, the complexity I think we're facing and I have actually personally absolutely no answers. I'm getting more confused now than I was maybe earlier. So I don't know if it's a sign of early decline cognitive. But but I, I think that here again, well, if you... Uh, try to design this experiment without having a precise working hypothesis or a biomarker, a stratification biomarker, you will not go anywhere. Uh, typically, from what I understand, for instance, from uh, Sarkis Masmanian studies and so, typically in, in, in their settings, they had at least a working hypothesis with particular neuromediators and things. So they didn't necessarily address actually the whole range of autism, but at least they could target a subpopulation that might show actually a correlation, a specific a correlation between this regulation yeah, of particular precise. neuromediator and certain form of autism. And I think that clearly here again, we need more data to stratify better. To stratify, stratify. exactly. Yeah. Right. I agree. Right. So, okay. So I'm very mindful of the time this morning. I've got a small housekeeping announcement to make. At 12, there will be a light lunch, but it's lunch on the go. It's in the dining room. There will be some sandwiches for people who um, want to eat something before they leave. Um, I think we should now thank our um, panel. Thank you very much. And I'd be delighted to introduce our next speaker, who is Ben Van Omen, who's going to give us our closing lecture on nutrition of the future. So I hope, Ben, you're going to answer all the unanswered questions that we just had. <laughs> no, no, I'll keep on talking, don't worry. What's happening? So, good morning, everybody. <laughs>